In this conversation, I interview Ramani Ram Ramachandran, or Ram for short. He is the CEO and co-founder of Router Protocol, and Router is solving the blockchain interoperability problem with mesh networks. We talked about bridges. We talked about interoperability in blockchain, what those mean from a simple, explain it to me, like 12 perspective. We talked about pricing and trading, although Ram is not a trader. We talked about some psychological patterns or trends among traders. And lastly, we wrapped it up with thoughts on the political landscape, the regulatory landscape. We chatted about network states, the emergence of new countries funded by crypto communities, and much more. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Here is Ram. If you do, please give us a thumbs up or share this podcast with a friend. It really does help us grow. Here you go. All right, Ram. Well, thank you for hopping on today. I'm excited to talk more with you. So being CEO and co-founder of Router Protocol, I'd love to just get a quick sense of the origins of why you started the business and what specifically you're attempting to solve in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the opportunity. Pleasure to be on your show. Um, great question. Maybe just give a bit of a background of what I was doing prior to Router. So that was a natural film. Been in crypto for close to a decade now. I first got into crypto trying to bring to the blockchain privately traded securities. Previously, I was in innocent banking, asset management, pure finance, as these days is called TradeFi uh, or TradFi. Uh, so I did a bunch of things in crypto. Sometime in 2020, we built this Dex, uh, an automated market maker like Uniswap, uh, but on Polygon. And it was a uh, pretty uh, uh, interesting experience because Polygon was much cheaper than the Ethereum blockchain. It was faster, smoother, uh, but we found that not too many folks were using it privately because most of the crypto community was at least at that point, very much on the Ethereum blockchain, right? And that's when the light bulb went off and I speak to Sandeep uh, Nailwal, the founder of Polygon, and the, the, the big uh, outcome of the conversation was that we need to start building software that lets blockchain speak to each other. Uh, from an interoperability perspective. And and that's the genesis story, right? And, and I'll expand more on the, the various details on that going forward. Yeah, maybe quickly explain, like, why? what is Polygon's primary use case? What, why did they create it? And then why were you building on it? Why is it interesting? Got it. Got it. So Ethereum blockchain is like New York City, right? It's super popular. And everybody likes, or, or like a day. Right? Just yeah. keep it closer to home for you. It, it's uh, uh, it's it's very popular. Everybody wants to get in there. It's a thriving community of trading platforms, NFT platforms, borrowing lending and borrowing platforms, what have you, right? But then uh, the thing gets more popular, it gets congested, right? And then so some people sort of upstakes and they, they sort of uh, go off to the suburbs, right? So if in New York City, you go to Jersey City or Yonkers or upstate, wherever you go, I mean, if you have a lot of money, you better get correct ticket or whatever, right? So, uh, so a lot of uh, blockchains run up around Ethereum. So you have Polygon being one of them, right? And Polygon's essential thesis was this, I mean, we will run essentially what's like a layer two chain or a side chain for Ethereum, right? And you can use uh, Polygon to scoot around, do your transactions super fast, super cheap, right? And then periodically, we will make sure that the accounting of the mother blockchain, the Ethereum, is, is all legit, right? So that's what Polygon does. Uh, essentially gives Ethereum users a faster, cheaper, more scalable way to get things done. And now, it's all, now this is the thing, right? So you built, let's say, Jersey City, to use the New York analogy. That's where I spend most of my time in the use. So, and, and let's say you build a really cool pizza place or a nightclub just on this side of the Holland Tunnel, right? But there's no Holland Tunnel. So what do you do? Right? So, so the connectivity is not there. So you might have the coolest venue, trading venue, or a lending, borrowing venue, whatever. But unless you have a means to communicate with the main chain, Ethereum, right? You can't really grow these other platforms, other blockchains that you're building. And that problem gets solved uh, because since then, I think since 20, you've had a profusion of chains. We call it the siloing of blockchains, right? You have Ethereum, you have Polygon, you have Arbitrum, you have Avalanche, you have PSC. And then you have the whole non-EVM universe, the Cosmos chains, and then you have Algorand, then you have Polkadot, right? So all these are 
akin to cities and communities, right? And, and, and cities with their own vibe and energy and communities. And, and there's a million reasons why somebody might want to choose one over the other, right? So whoever you are, there's a good chance you might want to go to New York or London or Singapore or Dubai or whatever. But you might not, the vast majority of those folks are primarily tourists. They'll just go back to wherever they come from, maybe it's Portland or... So I think the essential idea is that there's going to be a fragmentation of capital and ideas and energy across these blockchains and this need for these to communicate with each other. So that that's essentially what Rocket does, uh, provide a way for blockchains to communicate with each other. And so what would be a descriptor for router, for router protocol of the company? Would you call it a, a bridge? Would you call it a, how do you describe it at a conceptual level? No, great question, right? So this, this has also been an evolution as with, especially with Zep3, the evolution was super fast. So initially we were just a bridge, meaning you could take a token from Ethereum and take it to Polygon, or you could go from Ethereum to Avalanche or Polygon to Avalanche or to Binance Chain or to Phantom. So it was just the asset transfer, the token transfer function. But now the industry has had maybe 12 to 18 months of a very fast iterative learning and feedback as is the way Web3 is. And now there is a clear differentiation happening in the sense that there are pure play bridges that just worry about getting a token across from point A on one chain to point B on another chain. Essentially swapping a token from one chain to another chain or transferring it. That would be your basic bridging framework. But then there's this whole class of pure play interoperability protocols, which is routed as one of them, which concerns with the generic problem of cross blockchain messaging and communication and and the whole asset transfer piece token transfer piece is just one use case just going beyond that router and there are a few other solutions can solve for a generic cross chain messaging and that's important because you as an app developer might want to sort of build an app that uses ethereum for its decentralization but solana for scalability and and maybe you prefer other than new chain that's coming up for this transaction speed or some some other attribute, right? Of the basically the three parts of the blockchain trial. So the router now basically is a core interoperability primitive that enables generic cross-chain messaging. That's that would be a descriptor to answer your question. Interesting. So there's now, would you say, a consensus in I guess pe- how people think about the differentiation of the businesses or the the offerings where we have bridges that are Are they actually moving currency tokens between, or are they just like a market maker that says, well, I have Ethereum and I want to move to Solana. So then there's someone on the other side who wants to move back and they make that chain, they make that, that trade trade or transaction. Uh, That's a great great point, right? So what's, what is actually happening is it's most of these bridges work on lock on one side and unlock on the other, unlock on the other. So it's just like you walk up to one side of the bridge and you you basically tell the bridge, listen, I want to send, let's say you're going from Ethereum to Matic, right? So on the, on the Matic, on the Ethereum side, your ETH is basically locked up, right? And an equivalent amount of Matic is released on the other side, right? And and, and in that process, there is a liquidity requirement, right? And mm-hmm. it's just, I mean, it, it can be a market maker, but more often than not, it's just, at the moment, it's platform liquidity. Right, where arms is bootstrap the liquidity and and and, and the, which is actually the reason why a lot of bridges have gotten hacked. Right, it's a bit like you have, let's say, you want to move ton of value from, let's say, Brooklyn to Manhattan. Right, it's like somebody drives up uh, to Brooklyn Bridge and then there are there's a, the whole Brooklyn Bridge. It's it's got a lot of armored trucks with a lot of gold. Right, and that's so you give a message of the. Brooklyn side, and then one armor truck goes into Manhattan. That's it's a very primitive design, and and, mm-hmm. and what that makes, what does, what that does is make Brooklyn Bridge a very nice honeypot, right? Bridges have a lot of value stored in them, right? So that's why you see more than two point five three billion in hacks targeting specifically bridges in the in the past couple of years, right? So mm-hmm. one of the things that Router did to address this problem early on was we had this interesting balancing mechanism where we ran at, at any given point in time, we had a fair a specific number of balances on each chain, right? And then we would sort of have an internal rebalancing algorithm that would sort of move this capital around through our own bridge without completely exposing it to the external world so that the attack risk was minimized, right? But you see a lot of the version one, generation one bridges, right? You'll still see the all tout how much TVL is locked in them. And, and it's, it's a very 
ugly metric, irrelevant metric almost, because it, it just, yeah, and, and it also leads me to believe that bridging is like the aviation industry and we are now between 1905, 1906 and 1937, between yeah. when the Wright brothers started their thing, I guess close to the country live, yeah, and yeah. 1937 is when the Hindenburg thing happened, right? And then I think we're still awaiting that one big Hindenburg moment when a massive bridge blew up that happens. And then after that, I guess people slowly understand that the TVL game is not the right way to play them. It's already happening, right? When you have USDC Circle, they're basically implementing their own version of liquidity provision across bridges. So a lot of bridges won't need to actually bootstrap or just have the liquidity exposed on their framework. They can just tap into USDC and indeed, I'm sure USDC starts other stable coins also going to follow suit and you'll have the liquidity problem solved pretty quickly. Interesting. And so it just takes some plane crashes to fall in order for us to have like a 99.99% safe airline system. So there's, you see, you, you don't see a change in how the structure of bridges work in, in Web3. It's more like we have to iron out the technical details, which takes some casualties yes. along the way. Yes, yes. And I guess there's also one more, so going back to your first point around the pure asset transfer bridges, they'll always be important because that's going to be a big use case. But then there's going to be this whole class of interoperability focused layers like routage, router and its uh, incumbent, uh, as it coming blockchain, etc. And I'll tell you more about router V1 and V2 and what we're planning, the roadmap, etc. But effectively, we have externally verified bridges where, you know, in the case of router, the V2 is going to be a full-fledged blockchain on the Cosmos network. And, and the validation is going to be a bunch of validators who are making sure that the message is valid and legit and, and has fidelity. And, and, and that of, that's obviously a two by three plus one consensus, right? And then you have, on the other end of the spectrum, you have natively verified bridges. These are what are known as light client nodes, right? And, and these are, you, know, you basically use uh, zero knowledge proofs, et cetera, in some cases. But effectively, these are very lightweight and, and sort of do not have the security risks of something like a pure play bridge. And I would say even a slightly less risk than even a, a POS based bridge like Router, because at the end of the day, theoretically, any POS chain can be hijacked because, right, all it, any, anyone needs to do is sort of capture two by three plus one amount of purchasing power or token bad. Right? It's a theoretical possibility, but okay. it's still a possibility. So, so again, in the bridging space, you have pure play asset transfer bridges and messaging bridges and router is the latter. Mm, gotcha. Gotcha. And when you take the latter approach that you did with router, what, yes. what is, what's the landscape look like? Like how many different organizations are in this space? What's the, what is it technically doing underneath the hood? Like, yeah, maybe walk me through it almost like I'm 12. Like if you think about what you're doing from a technical level. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's, there's a bunch of contracts that sit on the Cosmos chain, right? And, mm -hmm. and they have their own uh, sentinels or watchstars or listening points or gateways on multiple blockchains where the bridge has an endpoint on. And it's always listening for incoming requests. Uh, hey, I want to transfer a certain amount of value or I want to send a message saying this, uh, this much amount of tokens are being, or this app needs to be called on the chain, right? So it, it can be an asset, as I said, asset transfer or a message transfer. So these listeners sit on multiple chains and we sit on the Cosmos chain and, and sort of monitor these results. And the validators on the Cosmos chain that we have sort of run the consensus layers and make sure that if somebody wants to actually communicate something from chain A to chain B, that goes through in a manner where the fidelity is preserved. Mm, gotcha. And when you think about the future, what's, yeah. what does, well, I mean, I'm curious to hear your thoughts first on just where we are today. Like just from a high level, there's been, I'd say more turbulence in 2022 than any mm -hmm. other year, arguably mm -hmm. in crypto. Where, where do you feel things have sort of settled as far as the general sentiment among consumers and traders and maybe builders, regulators? Do you have any high level thoughts on where we are today? It's, we're recording this February 8th, 2023. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, you know, there are multiple, there are, well, there are a few self-evident facts. If you've been in the space, facts slash opinions, I mean, even that is, again, yeah. there is a self-referential contradiction there. <laughs> but I mean, at, at, at the first big change 
from, let's say, till 2018, the narrative was Bitcoin, which is proxy for crypto, is digital gold. And therefore, when there is a recession, when, when, when the market cycle sort of like right, what's happening right now, that is tightening, etc. Bitcoin, gold, etc. sort of become, start becoming more valuable. So that, that has changed now. At this point, risk of Bitcoin and crypto and, and this, Indian on crypto is they're all primarily risk assets. So they're all very much tied to the whole risk on risk off trade. Meaning when the US Fed and the European Central Bank, those central banks around the world start their money printers, start cutting interest rates, there is an upsurge and, and vice versa. So that fund, fundamentally it's a macro play, it's a risk on trade from a pure institutional trading lens on. From consumer lens on, I think, and now actually I was going to come to the consumer at the end. From a builder uh, lens on, I think uh, it's very, very soon, I guess, all of us figure out if you want to be the director of a movie, which means you're an investor or a VC or a trader, or you want to be a producer, uh, sorry, producer is the investor, the director is the guy who's actually making the movie happen, right? So most builders are directors, right? And, and we were to build, I mean, it's so much fun, it's, 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 it's just a very different sort of dopamine high, just, just shipping products and taking that attraction and trying to grow your baby and it is engaging in the, the, the daily uh, ebb and flow. And, and I think the core builders continue to build. Right? I mean, you have had every bull market. I think now we can see some of that, right? I've been increasingly getting a few more pitches that I'm trying to decentralize Uber. What do you think? And things like that. I mean, that comes around every beginning of a bull market, but the builders are willing. I mean, the core guys, especially in the bear market, it's, it's very good because you get the best talent, you get the audit firms mm-hmm. don't fleece you, the service providers don't fleece you. It's actually a nice time to actually build and, and that's continued and that will continue. And, and, and I think if you sort of sustain yourself through a couple of bear markets, then you, you don't really worry. You just need to make sure that you have a little bit of capital to make sure your ideas can be continuously churned at the lab and they hit the market. Now to the interesting question about the consumer perspective, right? I think consumers, uh, this retail traders and crypto users, right? I think traders got burned, right? I mean, a lot of them, uh, like with the equity markets, traders rush into the top, and they get completely hammered and they sell at the bottom. That's a, that's a story as sold as the markets. I mean, that happens every, every single time. And that's happened. I mean, all those friends that I told them to buy crypto back in 2015, 16, they all bought it in 2018. And then they were angry with me. And then I told them to buy again in 2020. They buy it in 22, peak, and then boom. Right? I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's always the case. Right? I mean, there's always the guy, uh, the, the, the devil always takes the hindmost, which <laughs> unfortunately the uh, end retailer. A trader. Now, from a user perspective, though, right, it's, 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 it's happening. It's happening in so many different ways that we're not even aware of it, right? It, it just, it's, it's like with the, uh, and there is, uh, there's so many different aspects to it. There has to be a certain amount of hustle and bubble narrative to it because it happened in the mid nineties. I'm sure we're all much younger. Dot com, you just put a dot com thing and you sort of get it listed on NASDAQ and the thing would go up and nobody would know what the website did, right? And then there were like these projects that raised millions and millions of dollars even back then, right? But then all that settled and settled down and now all that infra that was sort of built up and all the know-how led to what we later defined as Web2, right? The the Facebooks of the world, the Googles of the world, even Amazon, as arguably, right? I mean, it only started being a profit in 2002, 2003. So you have a little bit of that with crypto as well, right? You have every cycle, there'll be a champion who will be the darling of crypto Twitter and then he'll be grandstanding. And then this is some big blow up. And then the guy goes silent. Everybody starts shitting on him. I mean, that's also mm-hmm. fashionable, right? I mean, people just, crypto Twitter is brutal that way. One day, SBF is everybody's best friend. The next day, he's like the worst guy. I had always suspected this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fundamentally yeah. dishonest and self-serving and politicizing. I mean, that you, you can't look for honesty in crypto Twitter. I mean, Self-serving honesty, yes, but not complete honesty. Yeah. So, but, but there are applications getting built. Ultimately, crypto is about who has control, right? I mean, if you look at, if you even go beyond the narrative of how Facebook and Google and all these guys extracted value out of you, right? And captured a lot of value, right? I mean, you're getting a great experience, right? But eventually you realized over a period of time that these guys were making millions of dollars purely based on your data, right? And, and you have that. Even though, and, and, and you know, chat GPT, for instance, right? I mean, people are opening up everything. I mean, uh, the other day, my daughter was having a fight with my mom. So she said, how does an 18-year-old apologize to the mom you think? Right? So that's public data, right? So, and people are uploading models, uploading AI, you know, data feeding algorithms. 
Right? And all there is now, no, OpenAI has not opened it up. And right? OpenAI is incentivizing you to sort of make that model more powerful, but they're not opening it up. So in every, every uh, it seems like for the last 20 years, you see one large company that comes out and sort of tries to capture value. It ultimately what is an unfair manner, it's rent seeking, right? So crypto is fundamentally a pushback against that, right? And, and obviously there's going to be you know, decentralized social network lenses coming up. There's going to be a bunch of decentralized uh, applications. The DeFi, for instance, right? I mean, it, it has had a rough spot, but it just went through the roof. But essentially, why would you have a situation where you would want, it's, it's the old argument for Bitcoin, right? Why do you want a, set, a bank sort of charging you for the privilege of storing your money, right? So that argument is still valid and using the data. And, and people are seeing that you can, the first iteration of DeFi 1.2, that as we call it, has had its issues. There were a lot of, obviously some things worked, a lot of things did not work. Like you had 20 some things who were sitting on gasoline dollars and sort of did fun, funky things with that. So all that apart, the, the, the case for private control, uh, sorry, sorry, your individual control, self-sovereign identity, that has never been stronger. Right. And, and there are, you put it all together. I think uh, it's slowly happening. And, and the next cycle, you'll see a ton of interesting applications that you can't even think of. Right. I mean, everybody thinks that there's going to be one area that's going to be the big thing in the next cycle, but it's invariably not what the smart guys say. It's something completely different from the consensus. Right. I mean, who would have thought that Tix came out with a way to incentivize liquidity using their uh, liquidity farming program? And, and they just blew up. Right. And then it just became the foundation for DeFi 1.2. Same way, who knows what's going to happen in the next bull cycle. It could be move to earn or it could be something else that we're not even considering. Or it could be the NFTs on Bitcoin that's actually be a solution for Bitcoin incentivization problem. So so NetNet, I think, cycles apart, it's uh, from as, a, as a paradigm shift. It's fundamentally going to design, it's going to change the way products are designed and how they consumed. And I guess the one last thing on that is the UI UX, the user experience needs to change, right? I mean, the one big thing right now is the MetaMask wallet that you have. It's just, and then so typically the current user experience is so you take a hardware wallet and then you plug into USB and then you type in a bunch of numbers and it's a nightmare, right? So how do you sort of extract that out? And, and even that is sort of changing big time with things like account extraction and, and interesting Project like WorldCoin that just scans your retina and then sort of attaches it to a wallet. Right? And I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, there are pros and cons, but uh, fundamentally the point is user experience is fundamentally changing and that's going to be a big driver for the 80, 90% that's not already not on Web3 to move to Web3. Mm. Yeah, that certainly seems very accurate that different people yeah. will have different ideal uh, like login or, or privilege by interfaces, right? right? Like how I interface right. with my bank is different, but also the fact that I have it on a thumbnail and if I lose the thumbnail, then it's all gone. Like that's, yeah. that doesn't work for m most people. And so right. finding that middle ground seems like a potential big breakthrough. Do you think that there is a, do you think it's necessary or inevitable that there will be a theme to the next bull market in the same way that there seem to be these thematic rises in coin initially, that was like the theme. And then it's like Ethereum and then it's DeFi protocols and then it's NFTs and everyone get, kind of gets excited around this one theme. Uh, mm -hmm. and then, or do you think we're kind of beyond, like all the themes have been, all the cards are on the table, so to speak. Like all the tools are there. Now it's like this kind of gradual improvement of the tools and the technology to the point where it really becomes to people everywhere? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I guess it been through a couple of cycles and I guess it might be that it's not just one theme that sort of becomes a dominant theme, but I guess maybe a cluster of themes. Mm -hmm. As you said, the UX improvements or it could be like NFTs and Bitcoin or it could be move to earn or it could be, yeah, it could right. be a cluster of themes as well. Absolutely. Cause, yeah. Cause but, but typically, more often than not, it, it's, there's always a chain involved. So as you said, maybe it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, it could be Cosmos, right? or, or those uh, non-EVM chains that, that sort of have, Cosmos is interesting because it's sort of, it's, 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 uh, it's, an, it's a blockchain of blockchains, right? So right. unlike Ethereum, which sort of enables the proliferation of layer one side chains, which actually could end up becoming competitors, for instance, like even Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, they're all technically speeding up Ethereum. But once people start using them and 
if they have a token and it's, uh, they start pumping, I mean, there's going to be some element of a cannibalistic economic effect on Ethereum at some level, right? So, so maybe Cosmos might be the next theme. So, yeah, but I think the, the, the broad point is still valid. I mean, it might not be a narrow theme like it was in the last two cycles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ultimately, when we even talk about a thematic rise or a bull market, we're talking about money and other currencies coming into crypto. So this is typically through institutional funds kind of lead the charge, like A16Z yeah. raises 300 million to deploy in crypto. And that right. thus for, for regular investors, people who are not looking at crypto more than three hours a week, but they have a few right. thousand dollars to spend. They're kind of like right. the, they're kind of like the, the afterburners. They're like the fuel on the fire where they come yeah. in and all of a sudden it's like, it's, it's jacking up the price and that the, the pricing of these particular assets it becomes, it, it seems to become so, what would you call it? Like inaccurate, like the actual, mm-hmm. what do we, what is Bitcoin worth? Well, the market is, is trying to figure that out. We don't, we don't quite know. And as these new coins arise, we're trying to figure out what they're worth. Right. What the, one thing I wanted to get your opinion, your feedback on something you said earlier, which just had me thinking was when you think about the the people that you may have told to buy Bitcoin back in 2018, they bought it 2020. Uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 it seems like that humans are, this is just a theory, but that people are, we're biased and we're falling for almost a predictable bias where the more, more consensus, so the more, the greater the percentage of the population of people that I personally trust believe that something is a good idea, the more likely than, than we are to be correct. That's kind of the fundamental bedrock ideology of democracy is that right, the right, population right. votes and that by consensus of the masses, that's which way mm-hmm. the civilization goes. Should we build mm-hmm. the building? Should we invest in healthcare? Should we, whatever the decision is of the society, it's, it's mm-hmm. effectively that we're going to pull the population through various mm-hmm. levels of abstraction with representatives or whatever. But ultimately, stocks are different and, and crypto is different because the success right of your decision individually, the success of my yeah. vote, my ROI yeah. and my vote is determined yeah. by whether people in the future will purchase that. So right. it's like that, and that's the, that seems like the key difference is that your friends you told to buy Bitcoin, when you right. told them to buy Bitcoin, no, people right. weren't buying, there wasn't right. consensus, but that's precisely right. why it's a good investment. And so I, right. I think right. there's right. almost right. this right. like cognitive dissonance where people, they think it's a good investment when everyone else is buying it. But that's like precisely right. the definition of what's not a good investment. Does that resonate right. with you? Or? It, it does, it does. It sort of, sort of reminds me of something I read in Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Mm. By Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman. And, yeah. and he keeps using that analogy with, you know, five already, six already years ago, or even right now, if you're a deer or, or, or some sort of a full-leg beast in a herd and, and you see your other friends, dear friends running, there's a lion in the bushes on the, you run, right? You don't right. analyze and you let me try and go against the culture. That's a pure survival thing, right? I mean, I mean, you're on a ship and you see everybody jumping off, you jump, I mean, right. something coming to hit you over, right? So, so I, guess it, I guess there are simple problem frameworks, but I guess investment is fundamentally a far more complex problem framework, right? And I guess you're absolutely right. It's, you're better off, like, classic except, right? Even, one month ago, that the stock to flow ratio of Bitcoin was screaming by at its 14, 15K. I mean, absent any other major shock like USDT going down or Signature Bank going down or some crazy stuff happening, it was patently evident that Bitcoin is going to go back from 15 to 25, 35, whatever the number is in the next few months, right? But you just couldn't really bring yourself to buy because in all groups, WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, people are shitting about, oh my God. Are we going to see 12K? Are we going to see 8K? Right? I mean, but I, maybe the way to do this is, and this is how the best investors, I guess, do it. They have a framework, they have a process, right? And then as long as they stick to the process, the, the way they arrived at the decision, they're more worried about if checking off on the boxes in that decision-making framework, rather than you getting worried about if it's a flip of a coin, did they make money or not? And I guess... Once they stick to the process, you no know, seven times out of ten, six times out of ten, they probably make money, right? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And, and do you do you feel like either personally you have a good process, or do you know people who have a good process, or is it generally more of like, hey, this is a good asset, I think, and it's on the spectrum of gut decisions to 
hyper analytical? Where do you feel like you personally lie or people that you respect lie in that spectrum of crypto investing? Right. So, so I'm a builder, right? I mean, I'm not an investor, yeah, so I don't yeah. have a process. I'm very much. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right. Women fancy of <laughs> the popular news flow. So Catherine of Arts, Faith got us a million dollars. Boom. Let me go and buy something. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. I no, appreciate no, the honesty. It's not that bad. <laughs> no, but it's not, it's not that bad. I mean, it, it's, no, when, when you're building, you don't have time to. Yeah. It's just an opportunity cost. I mean, you're better off. Yeah. Playing in your core, whatever area of strength is. But I know a ton of investors who, and that I, and, and I know folks that, that are not on Twitter. I mean, no, nobody knows about them, but these guys have been very methodically buying stuff. And I know this one guy who's very really under the radar. He went to the Solana Breakpoint conference in Portugal and he saw a bunch of 20 something showing off their Lamborghinis and Ferraris. And he told us, you know what, this is not going to end well. Mm-hmm. He, he immediately sold off his whole crypto stash, all his Bitcoin, Ethereum, and like 4K, 60K, what were the price points for Ethereum and Bitcoin. And then he started buying his assets, real estate, factories and stuff. And, and now he's divesting from that. He's coming back and buying some more Bitcoin and Ethereum. So there are guys that, that are yeah. able to do it. And I wish they would share the magic sauce. I mean, but I guess well, yeah, it's going to be done. <laughs> Well, I think I feel like the magic sauce there is actually quite simple, which is that when people are greedy, be stingy. When people are stingy, be greedy. Like, like <laughs> yes. the Warren Buffett idea. The is, great, uh, this, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so so let's probably... let's talk. Let's talk about building. So tell me what it means to, to to you to think about where router goes in the future. Like what gets you really excited about building this this tool? Yeah, let's just start there. What do you what do you yeah, look at the future? What you're building? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's. It's, it's I, I guess we all build mental models and narratives and, and you know, one model that's really resonated with me, especially I'm having conversations with folks like you, is if you go back 20 years, imagine 99, 2000, you had, uh, you had Linux, you had Apple OS, you had Microsoft, you had Enterprise, Sun Solaris, all these different variations. And even within Linux, you had SUSE and you had Red Hat, you had a bunch of Linux versions. And, and there's a beast, if you're a, if you're a board doc and and you're using a MacBook, and if you were to send it to me on my Microsoft Palm Pilot or whatever, it would be a complete nightmare, right? You couldn't really have seamless editing. Right? I would send it to you, the format would be all messed up, and then you let it download a piece of software. It's a nightmare, right? Mm-hmm. And then along came AWS, along came Google Docs, right? And then that changed two things, right? If you are an end user, you just open up a Google Doc, and then you type in, and it doesn't matter if it's an Android or iPhone or whatever, you could have your book or whatever. But we, we see the same thing, same user experience, same document, and they can do it live, right? Thanks to the bandwidth improvements. If you're an app developer, right? I mean, you have build once, deploy anywhere frameworks everywhere. So you, you don't need to separately build for Microsoft or Apple or whatever. You just need to solve for your AWS Docker instance and boom, you have a DAP that is working. I mean, obviously you need some UI tweaks, so it's not exactly fair analogy, but it, the, the developer experience is completely transformed after AWS, the user experience is completely transformed after Google Docs, right? Where we are in the blockchain space is you have, going back to the first thing we were discussing, you have a siloing of blockchains and therefore a siloing of user experience and a siloing of developer experience, right? If I were to build a DEX, I need to sort of pop over the, let's say I want to go to Avalanche, right? I need to pop the Avalanche guys, get their BB team involved, get the marketing team involved and then we're going to be, grow the Avalon system. And, and, and if I'm a developer and if I'm an end user again, right, I need to sort of figure out, okay, this yield farm is on Polygon, therefore I need Polygon RPC, so I need to move my tokens over, right? So there's a lot of complexity around using various apps and various blockchains, right? So what I'd like to believe that Router and indeed some of the other projects out there in the interoperability space are doing is abstracting out the complexity and building out the AWS and the Google Docs equivalent, right? It's basically, you have a website, you come in and you want to do something, you want to trade, you want to find the best trade for your Ethereum. It doesn't matter what chain that's available on, right? You have an interface that spits it out, right? So, and if you're a developer, right, you build an app, right? And, and that should work on any chain. It, and basically, that's important because that's the only way you can attract users from all the different chains. Right? So, I think that's what we're trying to solve sort of uh, masking the underlying complexity that is inherent at the current phase of the blockchain uh, uh, ecosystem. Interesting. Okay. And then when that happens, 
what will be the implications? So if it is, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be like the the underlying blockchains are just a middle way, right? You don't mm-hmm. need to. It's like if you want to book a ticket, you go to Expedia or or, or uh, Priceline dot com, and you see you want to, you want to go Portland to New York, and you want to fly in the state, and you want to win to a seat, and you want business class or Jim Connie or whatever. Right? And under the hood, what Priceline is doing is segregating across multiple ticket airlines, ticketing reservation systems, multiple agencies, right? It's doing all the complicated processing right. and, and sort of spinning back a price to you, right? Now, the Web3 version of price line would be, okay, you want to go from Portland to New York, all right, so I need to pay, my, my airplane has to fly over Chicago, so it, it has to sort of pay a tax there. Okay, I need to account for that, and then that's $50. And then it's got gate fee in New York, so let me calculate that, okay, that's out of the $20. So literally, you got to pay for all those fees when you go from chain to chain, right? So mm. if Web3 was the airline flight ticket booking experience, that's what you had. Right? But that's all abstracted away from you. So I think that's what you're going to have, right? You're going to have some sort of a front end, maybe even a chat GPT style interface where you go in and say, hey, listen, I want to buy Bitcoin. I want to buy some random okay, Shiba coin today because I have a hint that, you know, a lot is going to tweet out something about Dodge or Shiba or something. And this was the, it, it's going to sort of do all the hard work and the number crunching and the uh, routing and the, 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 all the complex analysis. And then it's going to spit out, all right, go here, click here, and enter your password, and then boom, this thing, Shiba, Inus, and your wallet. Mm. So I think that, that's the end goal. Maybe we get there in two years, maybe we get there in five years, but ultimately it's all about abstracting out the complexity and aggregating all that to a nice front end. It's interesting. And- what do you think is the biggest challenge today with with the actual coins and tokens themselves? I mean, one, one thing I'll throw out there to you is that I hear frequently that things are slow and things are expensive to move. And that for crypto to, to really have a, a massive impact on the internet, there needs to be fast and inexpensive transaction capability. Yet, mm-hmm. for some reason, we're fixated on Bitcoin that does not have that capability. And so... It, it seems to me like there's uh, some people I talk to that are in the camp of like Bitcoin, some fork of Bitcoin, Bitcoin SV or something is like, this is this is the one because it's fast and cheap. It could do 100,000 transactions a second, Bitcoin slow and whatnot. And then once it's fast and cheap, then you could actually have a bunch of really valuable products that people can use. Like you can have microtransactions and all, all these things that feel like they should be part of the internet that just don't exist today. Does that resonate with you, or do you think there's some other big problem that we're seeing? No, I think it's it's a problem, but I think that the technical aspect of the problem, I believe, has been solved to a very large extent. Right? I mean, Bitcoin transfers are they're still slow, but they're not, they're probably much faster than bank transfers. Scalability is an issue. That's why Ethereum came, and Ethereum actually okay. probably is not as it's probably definitely scalable than Bitcoin, but. And then you have Polygon and all these other chains. And even Bitcoin has its own Ethereum version, WBTC, right? Uh, and then you have stable coins, USDT, USDC, et cetera. So right now, if you want to send me a thousand USDC, you, I can just send you a wallet. Two minutes, you can send it to me. It's probably faster than any bank. So I think that from a technology perspective, and, and there are chains that focus on scalability, Solana, et cetera. I mean, there are criticisms on whether they're truly centralized or not, but that apart... Technically, to a large extent, I think we have solved it. I think the key issue is the regulation that's required for adoption, right? I think that the narrative of the Web3 community, uh, we need to get the narrative right, I think, because there is no one coherent narrative that sort of tries to understand regulators' concerns while also being fair to folks that really need decentralization in, in far flung parts of the world, right? I think, yeah. I think it's a narrative issue, and I think it's going to take time, and I, I believe it's going to take way longer than people assume it's going to be. I think it's, it's going to be a generational shift. I think that as boomers sort of move out of the center stage and <laughs> get mm-hmm. to a person of less power, and you have the 20s and 30s, they sort of are native Bitcoin. Right? I mean, if you look at, I was reading some statistic which said that almost 50 to 60 percent of under 30s in the USA have some form of crypto, right? So if given another 10, 15 years, they're going to be in positions of power in Wall Street and Silicon Valley and all that. And they're going to be far more receptive to ideas that are on Web3 and how it should be regulated and so on and so forth. So I think these things, the, the narrative and the acceptance is probably a generational thing. I mean, even boomers are not going to change. I mean, they are 
They want the retirement yeah. fund. They want two, three person, and yeah, they have no interest in asset appreciation. They just want to. They want asset preservation. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they want to keep U.S. dollar yeah. in their bank account, and that's it. Yeah. What what contrarian beliefs do you hold? What things do you think are true that most people would disagree with you? It could be in crypto. It could be in regulatory policy. It could be in, in anything you you that comes to mind. No, I think regulatory policy is a good one, right? I think that a lot of governments are. Very worried about, I mean, I can tell you uh, the Indian government, for instance, I'm sure the U.S. government as well, right? There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of fear about how crypto is going to come in and, and sort of be used by terrorists and money launderers and pornographers and so on and so forth. Right Now, the reality of the matter is these guys are already ahead of the game. They're using U.S. dollar and secrecy coins, and they're already doing it, right? So if you're a regulatory agency or a government official listening to this, I guess the one point I'd like to submit to you is that by opening it up, you're actually sort of laying it all out there and making the system stronger, more efficient, right? and making sure that the good guys have a chance to fight the battle. I mean, if you remember the mid-90s, when... The Internet Consortium, the guys behind the modern internet, they proposed the SSL, the Secure Socket, which is the foundation for HTTPS and modern e-commerce, right? The US government was very against it. They believed, you know, this is going to be misused. And right? that was their big thinking, right? I mean, the, the edge case sort of was front and center for them. They couldn't see the big potential that with uh, HTTPS and the Secure Socket layer would unleash. But then the industry sort of worked together, the Netscapes and Microsofts and which were companies that were at that point in time, sort of decided that if they would engage with regulators in DC, they would engage with other key stakeholders, and they made sure that there was some form of community self-policing, in the sense that if they, like, if somebody uploaded a crappy website with pawn or some sort of fraudulent activities or something, the community would come together and sort of flag it off and maybe report them to the authorities or whatever. And I think that insight is, is that's again, sort of going back to a previous point, I don't know, that Leap of faith is something that regulators have to make and sort of understand that technology inherently is good to engage with. And at the very least, they should provide sandboxes for all these technologies. And the funny thing is Singapore, India, all these governments provide sandboxes, but they just, just for, for the sake of it, there's nothing, no real innovation happening there. Yeah. The moment you try to push the barrier, I mean, they'll start come and clamp down on you, right? I mean, the Indian government, for instance, right? I mean, India is the largest recipient of remittances globally right, from blue-collar labor in the Gulf, from the Valley, from around the world. I mean, there's 1.5 million Indians. The good chunk of them are outside and they send a ton of money every, every single day, I would imagine. And now, almost 10 to 12% of that, of that many billions is lost in, in transaction costs, right? The imagine if the Indian government wants to sort of figure out, just with the U.S. government, some sort of Web3 mechanism where, you know, a stable coin, or some sort of uh -huh. far more efficient mechanism. Right? That, would, that would save many, many billions of dollars. Right? Now, it's not inconceivable. Technically, there's a solution. All it needs is the regulators to sort of sit down with each to cooperate and make sure that you know, such a system gets built and, and everybody wins because the dollar that you save, a good chunk of that can be used in making sure the bad guys are caught. Mm -hmm. right? So, so there, is, there is a need for regulators to understand that the crypto is actually good because blockchain is very, very public. Right, right. No, that's a very good point. Ram, last thing I want to ask you about, you mentioned earlier that you can see the analogy of these different cryptocurrencies like Solana and Ethereum, Bitcoin, they're like cities. So you say, okay, this is New York, LA, Portland. Have you followed Balaji's network states book and concepts? And do you see, do you have any high level thoughts on that? And do you see the, uh, the, that, that being the inevitability of the direction? When I say that, I mean, specifically that people are, are exiting the current governments and that there is a pool of money happening from some online crypto community that is purchasing land. People are moving to that location and starting new countries. Is that something that you resonate with or you, do you have issues with that? No, I think I've sort of been following, I've been read the book, but I've been listening mm -hmm. to some blog posts and sorry, to some podcasts and blog posts. And well, it, it, it's Interesting, and I'm sure not the first time in history, at various points in history, some forward-thinking folks have tried to do this. And I think at, uh, of all those points, if, if at any point in history something like that might happen, it's probably now because you have information which is mm -hmm. flowing freely, which is, and you have money that's flowing freely, right? So 
Yeah, if Balaji and ten of his buddies on a WhatsApp group decide to buy a big chunk of island somewhere, and I guess the again the technical part is solved for the logistics part is solved for. What I think is the big issue is regulation, right? All you need is some small random fishing boat or some fisherman in a nearby town that sort of runs that drift and gets into trouble or whatever, right? I think so. At that point, nation states are always going to be preserving their power. And that includes currency, that includes geography, that includes whatever. So there's always going to be some friction and and that acceptance of something like that, especially in a physical form, will only come when the narrative shift happens, as, as we discussed earlier. I mean, it is perfectly, I mean, what is stopping Balaji from buying a small island? Today? And then even apart from the physical part of it, right? I mean, uh, Taos are probably a nice, a pretty interesting way where you know, people are coming together and collectively taking decisions yeah. and channeling economics towards a common end goal, right? But even DAOs are now coming under the purview of regulation, right? Because, and sometimes the DAOs themselves do that because that gives them more leeway to operate within the current fiat framework. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating question. I don't know how to answer your question. Right? Yeah. I mean, the more I think about it, the pros and cons come up. <laughs> yeah, no, it is complicated, yeah. but it is fascinating. Yeah. I, I yeah. saw the stat that over 50% of the countries in the United Nations have under 10 million people. And if you think about 10 yeah. million people, like you can go on Twitter and find accounts with more than 10 million. To, to, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The GDPs of, of these countries are smaller than, you know, Balaji and 10 of his friends. Like not, not, not him specifically, but just the, the capability to yeah. raise money cryptographically yeah. in a community is just super powerful. Yeah. So interesting so, well, to see where it goes. But I mean, yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, right? I mean, why is fiat valuable? Because the US government or some government has guns and helicopters right. and gunships, right? So at some point when it comes down to the end of it, will Balaji and his friends end up owning gunships and, <laughs> okay, you could make a case that you know, it could be cyber warfare and we're going to hire a bunch of hackers and bring all systems down. But at the end of the day, it becomes who has more force, right? I mean, it's not about who is ideologically right or who is financially more powerful, but who has more, eventually it comes down to who has more force. Right. Well, and that's the core. Yeah. It may, it, it, in some cases, it does. In the case where you have a large centralized country, th then you could say mm -hmm. like China, US, large centralized countries. So it makes sense to have a military. If you're very decentralized, mm -hmm. like if you had an archipelago of a bunch of locations or you had city states all over the place, even like a Bitcoin mm -hmm. network, like if the US government wanted to take down Bitcoin and they wanted to get, if they wanted to get ROMs Bitcoin, they could do that because they have one target. Yep. But if they wanted to get yep. 10,000 Bitcoins, uh, Bitcoin holders, they have to come to my house with guns. It's just very expensive. So it's difficult for centralized militaries to deploy their arms in, across mm. a decentralized front. But that's why mm. the US effectively lost against Iraq, lost against Vietnam. It wasn't because they had stronger militaries, because there was more decentralized in their resistance. So I fair think point, that's fair the point. Yeah. But I think, do you think that given you know, DARPA and the brain power they have, or the money they have, if they were to bring down Ethereum or, or, or Bitcoin, I mean, they wouldn't need to sort of come off to you technically, right? They would just call up Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and you know, 10 funds and tell them, you know what? Right. Go and just shot these guys, right? I mean, there are other ways to bring down financial networks though, right? I mean, well, I, I would argue that that's not going to bring it down. It's Bitcoin. Like if they, if all banks in the U.S. stopped allowing Bitcoin to exchanges, Bitcoin's right. still going to exist. I'm still going to have it in my account. It's just the, the bridge is going to be blown up. And so that's effectively right. a declaration of war. Now it's like, right. okay, everyone needs to make a decision. Which side of the bridge, do you, which side of the river do you want to be on? Do you want to put, keep your money in Bitcoin? Do you want to keep it in U.S. dollar? And that's effectively your vote right. toward, it's like, so I think... It's, it's, for me, it, this is where I'm like, it's hard to see it as much as I would absolutely love the U.S. government being very supportive of crypto. It is against yeah. their interests in the, especially the Federal Reserve as crypto becomes more powerful. Yeah. And so, right, there's like yeah. an eventual yeah. conflict of interest, especially yeah. as it pertains yeah. to international countries using the U.S. dollar yes. and the global reserve currency. So that's right. right. It's literally... Throwing a question mark at the concept of what a nation is because it derives its power from money. And, and actually, if any government supports crypto, it should be US because what USDT and USDC are doing are, are, are dollarizing the global economy, right? I mean, any part of the world, Dubai, Singapore, India, 
the crypto community uses USDT. They're not using a crypto version of the ruble or the Vinod right. or the whatever, right? I think, so US government should actually listen a trick there. I mean, they should just go all out and support the stable coins and <laughs> yeah. make sure the USD, yeah. But even then, even then, US, I look at USDC and Tether and those stable coins as just a, 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 a layer on top of the fiat. I mean, there's still fiat because true, ultimately, true, like, true, who true, controls true. The, the money press, right? Like, still the Federal Reserve. Yes, yes. Which is where right. the, you the, know. True, 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 true. Yeah, absolutely. But that's one more level of fire. I think yeah. there's some way from there, though, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, yeah. I don't want to take too much of your time. Ram, congrats on all the progress with Router. It's been a really fun conversation. I hope to have you back on someday. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And yeah, thank you for your time. And speak again soon. Cheers.